Hi everyone, today I'm going to present my recent work on aperture mechanics of slow sleeve and earthquakes. Here I show you an example of dynamic earthquake rupture. What you see here is a rupture starts from the hive center and propagates across the fort. As the fort sleeps, it radiates the seismic waves. The leading edge of the sleeping area is what we call rupture flam. The rupture speed describes how fast the rupture flam is moving. The relation between rupture flam and the seismic waves is analogous to these examples of water waves. A water drop can produce circular waves, and the source can be simply modeled as a point. In seismology, small earthquakes are usually modeled as a point source. But large earthquakes have fast moving rupture flam. That is more like the right example. That, is, that shows a boat of water. Here you can see the water waves produced by the moving source is very different from those produced by a point source. In the same picture, there is another boat. You, can, you may say it is not moving because there is no water waves around it. Here I show you another picture of water waves produced by a slowly moving duck. I think the speed of this duck is slower than any boat. But here you can see a similar water wave pattern as those produced by a fast moving boat although the amplitude of the produced by the duck is much lower. So while we can observe the water waves depend on the speed of the moving source, either faster or slowly moving source can produce similar water waves. That is because they are controlled by the same law of gravity. In natural force, we also observed a wide range of speed for the moving rupture flam. The rupture speeds of earthquakes are usually as fast as the S-wave speed. For large earthquakes, the rupture propagation is confined at the depths and propagate horizontally. Around 20 years ago, scientists found a kind of very special rupture, what we call slow sleeve event. The rupture speed of slow sleeve events are much, much slower. Few observations show that slow sleeve events may even trigger earthquakes. For both large slow sleeve events and earthquakes, their rupture length is usually longer than their width. On the right figure, I compared the global data set of slow sleeve event, regular earthquakes, and laboratory experiments. The vertical axis is the rupture speed, the horizontal axis is the peaks deployed. You can finally observe the rupture speed span a wide range from as slow as a snail up to as fast as a Loki. Rupture speed increases with peaks deployed. For regular earthquakes, the amplitude of seismic waves are so strong that we can de detect the shaking waves. But this is not a case for slow sleeve events. So we need to use the GPS to constrain uh, their source property. The empirical scaling relation between seismic movement and uh, rupture duration has been used to understand the physics of slow sleeve events. For regular earthquakes, they found a cubic scaling relation. To compare with this cubic scaling, they compiled the global slow earthquakes, including slow sleeve event, low frequency, and very low frequency earthquakes, and they found the scaling is linear. Therefore, they suggest that the behavior of slow earthquakes is different from regular earthquakes. But in recent studies that focused on the slow sleeve event in a particular environment, they found the moment duration is near the cubic. So they suggest the physical mechanism of slow sleep is similar to regular earthquakes. In this debate, the main difference is that they use different data sets. The most recent paper considered a particular environment such as in Cascadia subduction zone, while the earlier paper include multiple data set. So here the question is that why the moment duration scaling depends on the data set. Here I'm going to answer these two general questions. What is the general mechanism for slow sleeve event and how to reconcile the debated moment duration scaling relations? We know the ruptures of large earthquakes usually saturate the depth boundaries and form an elongated rupture area. We have studied this kind of ruptures numerically and analytically. In order to make this 3D rupture problem mathematically tractable, we made some approximations. 
Here we simplified it as a full space model and consider a planar fold with finite width. The rupture propagation on such long fold is controlled by the energy release rate and the reflection energy. Here the energy release rate is a function of the rupture width instead of the length. When the energy release rate is larger than fracture energy, the rupture accelerates. If the energy release rate is smaller, then the rupture decelerates and finally stops. We were able to fit these numerical results with a theoretical equation of motion. This equation is fundamentally different from the classical 2D equation of motion. In this equation, the left turn is what we call a force turn. It is a function of the energy ratio the ratio of the fracture energy to the energy release rate. On the right is the mass function, and the last term is the rupture acceleration. These ruptures are non steady state. This cartoon is an analogy to this equation of motion. Suppose you are pushing a box, and the net force acted on this box is positive, then it accelerates. If the force is negative, it decelerates. Now how can we get a constant speed? One condition is that the net force is zero, so the acceleration is zero. It results in the energy balance condition for a steady state. But only this condition is insufficient. Suppose you are pushing a box on a sleepy ground, you will find it impossible to move at a constant speed. So there should be another stability condition for a steady state. Actually, it requires the force term to be a decreasing function of the speed. For long rupture, the energy ratio should be an increasing function of the rupture speed. In brief, this theory predicts these two critical conditions, the energy balance and the stability condition. Let's are presented on the right sketch. This purple curve is the energy ratio as a function of rupture speed. A steady state rupture is predicted when these two conditions are satisfied. The rupture speed depends on the frictional properties. This theory is fundamental because it does not involve any specific friction law. But what kind of friction law can guarantee these two conditions? Here I show one example from a laboratory experiment on frictional behavior of logs. The horizontal axis is the slip rate and the vertical axis is the force strength. This result shows the friction is velocity weakening at low slip rates, but above a certain critical slip rate, it transitions to velocity strengthening, and at a seismic slip rate, it becomes velocity weakening. Because the rupture speed is positively related to the slip rate, so this velocity strengthening at a certain range of slip rate is expected to produce steady state ruptures. In addition to this experiment, other frictional mechanisms that involve the changes in fluid pressure may produce similar results. For example, the four gauge dilatancy can produce a similar strengthening, and the thermal pressurization can produce a strong weakening at seismic slip rates. In this study, I validated the theoretical prediction by a simple latent state of friction law with transition above a critical slip rate. All the simulations are single rupture. For rupture speed close to Earth's wind speed, I used a fully dynamic model. Otherwise, I used a quasi dynamic model to simulate the slow ruptures. The models have a finite four ways. I found indeed the steady state rupture can be produced in the numerical simulations. As the left figure shows, the steady rupture speed spans a wide range from very slow speeds up to the Earth's wind speed. On the right figure, it shows the two theoretical conditions are satisfied in all these numerical models. The numerical simulation also shows the dependency of the steady rupture speed on the stretch drop and the critical slip rate on the left figure. Each symbol represents one single rupture. The color indicates the critical slip rate. If the rupture speed is much slower than the SV speed, it increases with the stress drop following a similar trending. But this trending is distorted when the rupture speed is close to the SV speed. This is because of the effect of the Lorentz conjecture. Accounting for this Lorentz conjecture factor on the right figure, 
I found all the simulation results are correct onto one single curve after normalization. And all the results are well predicted by the theoretical equation of motion. So that means the rapture propagation of slow sleeve can be predicted by the same fundamental theory that was first used for non steady earthquake ruptures on long fault. Here I provide an explanation of why the moment duration scaling may depend on different data set by a simple rupture model. On the left, it shows a uniform shear stress model. As the shear stress increases, both moment and duration increases, but follows a linear scaling variation as the right figure shows. But if the shear stress is heterogeneous as a simple linear decay model, the simulation result shows that a simple heterogeneity can produce a cubic scaling. Actually, a recent paper based on a cycle model also shows that a cubic scaling can be obtained by a heterogeneous shear stress. So both models demonstrate that a cubic scaling operation can be obtained by heterogeneity of shear stress. Such cubic scaling is obtained under the assumption of constant effect normal stress that may explain the condition of a particular environment. But this cubic scaling is diagonally shift if effect normal stress varies over a significant range, as the left theoretical prediction shows. It predicts that as sigma increases, both moment and duration increases linearly. Therefore, if Mixing data with a diverse value of sigma, a linear envelope of the moment duration scaling is obtained. As the right figure shows the grade bars, none of the other parameters of the model produce a similar li linear envelope like the sigma. Slowly, even usually rupture each four segments separately, but some events can occasionally bridge multiple four segments and form large magnitudes. The historical earthquake data also shows large earthquakes are usually confirmed within separate segments, and some super huge events can bridge multiple segments. The super cycle behavior of slow sleep is similar to that of the max earthquake, but their time scale are different. Large earthquake super cycles are challenging to study due to their long recurrent times. But the formal connection between regular earthquakes and the slow sleep event revealed in this talk indicates that a future investigation of the kinematics and dynamic of slow sleep event will enable to build a comprehensive slow sleep event supercycle model. That in return will help to better understand the supercycle behavior of large earthquakes. Some observations show slow sleep event may trigger large max star earthquakes. The fundamental model developed here provides a new framework to explain how a slow sleep event transition to an earthquake if combined with the laboratory observed frictional mechanisms. In a low seismic coupling for segment, the accumulated shear stress is low. If the velocity transition mechanism dominates, then the energy ratio function could be like this pupil curve shows. Then the rupture speed is confirmed to be a low value and a stable value, and therefore only forms a slow sleep event. Once this slow sleep event propagates into a high seismic coupling segment, where the accumulated shear stress is high and the thermal weakening mechanism dominates the strengthening mechanism, then the steady state slow sleep event could transition to a non-steady earthquake and accelerate toward the earth with speed. Here are my conclusions. We have developed a new theory that integrates slow sleep event and earthquakes. This fundamental model recognizes the, the observed moment duration scaling relations and open new avenues for understanding earthquake slow investigation of frequently occurring slow sleep events. If you are interested in our works, you can find my paper in this reference. Thank you very much for your attention.